So it's worth remembering that some behaviours do change. Equally, human nature doesn't change very much. So those people who think that large parts of human behaviour after this is all over aren't going to revert at all to the prior state, that, you know, that's wrong. But there are behaviours which require a surprising amount of upfront investment to discover the benefits of the new behaviour. And so being forced to adopt a new behaviour also has the byproduct that you suddenly notice the benefits of the alternative behaviour, which were previously invisible to you. Hello, everyone. I'm Larry Weeks. Welcome to another episode of the Bounce Podcast. Today on the podcast, my guest is Rory Sutherland. Rory is an author, famous ad man, being the vice chairman of Ogilvy & Mather. He co-founded Ogilvy Change, which is a behavioral science practice where they believe the greatest gains to be made in business and society are psychological in nature, not technological. Rory has been written up as one of the most admired intellects in advertising. You got to check out his TED Talks. They've been seen by a cumulative 7 million viewers. This is Rory's second appearance on the podcast. The first was episode 20. Still very popular. Check it out. And I've asked Rory to come on again because... He has his finger on the pulse of consumer psychology, and I wanted his take on the impact of shelter-in-place, stay-at-home orders to our respective Western worlds. How will consumer behavior change? What about the workplace behavior? I think Ogilvy Mather has over 23,000 employees or so. What should big brands do amidst all of the change that's going on? So this is a wide-ranging conversation, very interesting. It'll go by quick, 43, 45 minutes or so. And we talk about consumer behavior, which behaviors will change permanently, which are inherently resilient, the future of the workplace, public policy, travel, movies. What does he think about marketing and advertising on the edge of a hopefully waning pandemic? Rory's always entertaining, incredibly interesting to listen to. So without further ado, let's, let's get right to Rory. Rory, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure. Thank you. So your book, Alchemy, I, I just want to push people to that book because it's, it's really good. So for the context of our discussion, I just want to lay the basis for our audience. You're in advertising, but, but a large part of your field of study is kind of behavioral psychology. And advertising is part art and part science, in my opinion. That's fundamentally about human behavior. It's interesting that David Ogilvy always said, people described Ogilvy as the University of Advertising, and he didn't like that description very much because he thought it sounded too academic and too theoretical. And he wanted it to be thought of as the teaching hospital of advertising. In other words, I think he saw the analogy as being medicine, which is both actually an art and a science. You know, a very large part of medicine is scientific, but actually at an individual level, it remains, you know, something which is a kind of craft as well at the same time. And, you, you know, you learn by doing very much. And I think, I think that's, that's true. And so, no, and I think it's very strange. I mean, one of the mysteries, I suppose, at the heart of the book is why not only in advertising, but everywhere else as well, the focus paid on psychology and human perception, which really lie at the very grounding of what you do. You know, I mean, if, if, if human perception were completely objective and completely trusting, as economics believes, you wouldn't need marketing at all. People would simply uh, know exactly what they wanted, how much they're prepared to pay for it. And the context in which you presented the thing or the way in which you presented the thing would have no bearing on sales. Now, either that's true, in which case the entire marketing function and advertising industry is a completely unnecessary anomaly, which doesn't seem to be true, I think. Or else, economics is ridiculously content to devise a model of the world in which what is often most important, which is not what the thing is, but how we perceive it, because by simply changing the context of something, you change our perception of it. So your premise is, the economist's view is that human beings generally make rational decisions, and the behaviorist view is that people do things primarily for the rewards they bring and how they feel. And also how we perceive something and the likely rewards we anticipate from something depend on the frame of mind with which we view it. Right. There are two reasons for people's behavior, the, the logical and then the real reason. 
the psychological reason, which has a logic to it. I'm not suggesting for a second that it's completely random and strange. But I mean, you know, at the very simplest level, you know, common phrases you see in everyday marketing, like for the price of a cup of coffee a day, you can, or, you know, how else does a month's salary last a lifetime or Guinness, good things come to those who wait. It's interesting how many great end lines in advertising actually are based on a fundamental insight of behavioral science. Yeah. So it's logical in the sense that we've evolved to behave in seemingly illogical ways, but they're logical in the sense of the reasons for the feelings. There's some form of survival, propagation, what have you. I think at the very bottom of it, there's a great book an American academics brought out called The Case Against Reality. And at the very bottom of all this is simply human perception and epistemology, as it were. And he makes the point that if you look at it from the bedrock of evolutionary psychology, if evolution has to, to give it kind of agency, which obviously it doesn't have, but if it has to have, make a trade-off between fitness and accuracy, it's going to choose fitness every time. With these glasses on, looking through these particular behavioral psychology glasses or behavioral economics in the current state of what's happening around the world, we're all sequestered or some of us are starting to reopen and a lot of businesses are shut down or businesses have had to change the way they do business, right? Quite frankly, with the video and delivery and so on and so forth. The future to a large extent has been pulled forward digitally, I, I think, but I would love to know what Rory Sutherland, how you see this from a standpoint of behavioral economics. First of all, it's worth remembering that there are all different kinds of behavioral change. In other words, there is behavioral change, which is kind of irreversible. So I don't know anybody or of anybody who has had a mobile phone and has then got rid of it. You know, that seems to be behavioral change as a ratchet fairly much, you know, Equally, if you don't have a microwave now, the odds are you just have a peculiar aversion to them and you're never going to buy a microwave. So that's why in some ways product adoption is a bit like virology. It tends to follow a kind of sigmoid curve. You know, maybe the best way to look at it is on a log scale, just as uh, virus infection rates are best viewed on a log scale. So it's worth remembering that some behaviors do change. Equally, human nature doesn't change very much. So those people who think that large parts of human behavior after this is all over aren't going to revert at all to the prior state. You know, that's wrong. But there are behaviors which require a surprising amount of upfront investment to discover the benefits of the new behavior. And so being forced to adopt a new behavior also has the byproduct that you suddenly notice the benefits of the alternative behavior, which were previously invisible to you. There's a wonderful experiment on the London Underground where they had a strike on three lines of the Underground. So everybody who usually used that route for their commute had to find a plan B. And some academics from, I think, Cambridge and London looked at the travel card data, which is, it was effectively individualized but not personalized for the period before, during, and after the strike. And they discovered a significant minority of people continued in full or in part with the new route to work after the strike was over. And that was because the forced intrusion of the strike had forced people to explore a different behavior. And in some cases, they found that the new behavior was better than the old one. Not everybody adopted the new route to work all the time, but it became part of their repertoire. Some people did adopt the new route to work all the time. And so you know, one interesting thing will be it, it's highly unlikely that the use of video calling will revert to the level it was at before. You know, it's not likely that every single person in every office job in the world will do their, all their work from home. I'm not suggesting that. But I think it will find a new equilibrium because it's been jolted out of the old equilibrium. Then I think there are behaviors, what you might call, where human nature remains the same, but where people become, in the words of my colleague in New York, Chris Graves, people become more extreme versions of themselves. So one of the best lessons I ever had from a futurologist was there aren't really trends, there are vectors. And for every trend, there's a kind of counter trend. And what tends to happen is people notice one half of the vector, but not the other half. So one of the interesting things about this lockdown is people's shopping has been either from very large online grocery firms or it's been much more local than before. 
Or, for example, people who are going to physical shops, they're doing one very large shop rather than several smaller ones. And the extent to which those behaviours will stick, I think, are interesting. I think some behaviours will be very sticky. Some will result in a kind of recalibration. And in other behaviours, it'll return completely to where it was before. But I think part and parcel of that is every situation is probably unique. So there's some work environments that people want to go back to however they were structured or however the people work there. Yeah, and that's something we'll have to kind of learn to counterbalance, actually, when, you know, because I suspect, I don't think we'll go back to working as normal afterwards. You don't? Uh, we can't, I mean, apart from things for a, for a fairly long time, we can't, because you simply can't fit that many people in an office. You know, a certain number of people will have to work remotely just to keep the population density of the office down. And so most meetings, I guess, will be mixed. There'll be a mixture of real and virtual. I remember, funnily enough, some colleagues of mine went to a meeting with Google Singapore. They were at Ogilvy in Singapore, and two of the people were at Google Singapore, and one of the other people was in Hong Kong or something. And they never actually met the people from Google Singapore because they were in a separate video booth or room. So I I remember that that Google's had this culture of uh, remote working and video calling for, as you said, for quite a few years, hasn't it? It has, but there's also... Google has been very, when I was there, adamant that the people that work for Google be in offices together. And their theory, I've experienced to be true anecdotally, was that there were conversations between teams in the hallways or accidents at the lunchroom, at the dining room. This ideas came out of these uh, happy accidents. Unintended, literally unintended Unintended. So, but, But Google planned it that way. In other words, Google said, no, 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 even though we are set up for remote and we're talking to teams all over the country, we want different teams to be in the same buildings. And they were, they were really adamant. They weren't very open to remote at the time when I was there, which is interesting. So to me, and I experienced it, I would talk to engineers and ideas would, would come up. I wonder what the effect is of this is going to be. I, I, I do see the efficiency and I do see the benefits, but there's some things we're going to lose if, if we're not together. You know. Well, I, I think the, the um, we're, we're looking at this very issue at the moment. And one of the things we're saying is that, first of all, some degree of flexible working, not many people, for not many people will it be 100%. Uh, in fact, for very few people will it be 100%. But some degree of working from home would be transformative. For example, if you take a, a real estate market like London, Let's say you spent three to three and a half days a week in the office and, th- and three and a half to four days a week where you're at home, including the weekend. What would the pressure be to live in central London? Well, actually, quite a lot less because, you know, you could decamp to the seaside. And OK, if you only had to be in London for three days of the week, the ratio of home to work would be sufficiently different that I think quite a lot of people could live somewhere quite a lot cheaper. The other thing is that what we're probably saying, looking at it at the moment, is that the way we design offices, we need to be a bit more extreme because the remaining, as Google spotted, the remaining and and unsubstitutable part of face-to-face and physical co-location is actually both deliberate, booked face-to-face meetings and accidental ones. And one of the things we're saying is that some people, introverts in particular, will be perfectly happy just going home when they've got work to do on their own. On the other hand, some people like keeping a very rigorous line between their home life and their work life. So one of the things we've realized is that the open plan office is to some extent neither fish nor fowl. So it doesn't allow you to completely self-isolate and get on with some, you know, highly concentrated, focused work. And at the same time, it's not perfect as a social space either. And so one of the things we're saying is what we want is two types of office space, the type that's effectively all about either deliberate, planned, or unintended chat. I mean, literally, chat. And then the other part of the office needs to be for those people who want to, A, they haven't got flats that are suitable enough for, you know, protracted work. And that should be almost a bit like a library where you go to get away from distractions. And the current office is really neither one thing nor the other. What I do think is dumb, and I've been saying this for years, is there are people who essentially get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, 5.30, have a two-hour or one-and-a-half-hour commute, so they get in at 7.30, and then they spend the first two two and a half hours of the day doing email. 
And my argument is, well, there are a large number of activities where there is no point to the office in doing them at all. They could have done them two hours earlier from home. And that, that's always made no sense to me, because my argument is, look, what's the point of inventing this technology if the behavior doesn't change to match? It's interesting what's going to be the impact to some aspects that are enjoyable when you're working in an office, because there is some enjoyment with kibitzing, like to your point, chatting. In other words, if you take that away, and by the way, I did some contracting consulting for a company out of London. All the teams were around the world, so there was no really effective office. No, there's no that at all, no. Right, but I would talk to people that we're not used to it. And it was lonely. It was isolating. And when we got together, there was, there was a lot of joy in that camaraderie and chatting. So, you know, this is a, a sticky wicket. You want to have a blend. And I, I, I like some of the points you're making, you're very thoughtful, kind of a, a hybrid approach to it. Yeah, I think it's got to be, I think it's got to be hybrid for most people. You know, there are exceptions. There are people who have, you know, terrible apartments or awful flatmates. There are people who equally... Or awful work environments or people don't want to go in. Oh, yeah, exactly. No, no, no. no. Or awful work environment is absolutely fair. But for the vast majority of people, it's always going to be a hybrid. What I think is obvious is that the pre-existing equilibrium, the ratio is wrong. You know, so when I first started work in 1988, 90% of things required your presence at the office. Okay, so obviously you could work with a pencil and paper from home and you could think from home and you could make phone calls from home, although they weren't that common then anyway. I mean, when someone phoned you at the office, the phone on your desk rang, not your mobile. Your faxes arrived at the office in 1988. The photocopier was in the office and it was the size of a small car. So you couldn't really have one of those at home. And pretty much everything you did, indeed, for a long period, your computer was in the office and you didn't have a laptop. Okay, so 90% of your time, and that meant effectively five days a week, required your presence in the office. Now, what the ratio is varies for lots of people and varies by temperament, but it's certainly no longer 90%. And it's certainly below 80%, which means that if you rejig the working week, you could certainly, for most people, have two fewer commutes. You know, if you said Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday is when we basically meet, hang out, Monday, Friday, or, or it could be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or whatever, are effectively the days when we actually um, work electronically. Whatever the new ratio needs to be, it is 95.5. It's somewhere else. And finding out that ratio, it'll, it'll vary for different people. But it's crazy if we, don't, if we don't recalibrate the whole thing a little bit. David Ogilvy, as far back as 19, I think it must have been in the 1960s, he said he never wrote anything in the office. All of his books were written at home. When he had to add copy to write, he wrote it at home. And he just said, there are too many distractions in the office. I can't actually reach. And that's very true of writing, by the way. There's no coincidence. I think a lot of journalists work from home. So, you know, two hours writing weirdly takes four hours time. And the first two hours are kind of getting into the mindset. There's a fabulous paper on that by Paul Graham, the Y Combinator guy, and it's called Maker Schedule versus Manager Schedule. And his point is that managers often drive organizations to work on manager time, which is you cram in as many meetings as you can in any given time. And his point is, if you're something like a coder, typically, and you've got a big problem to solve, if you put a half-hour meeting in at three o'clock, that isn't half an hour of time for them. That's the whole afternoon gone. Because in order to get into the sort of space of the problem, you need four uninterrupted hours to focus on nothing else. And I get that when I read that, it was a complete epiphany, I have to say. So moving away from work, what consumer behaviors do you think will change permanently? I think it likely, I think it likely that online grocery shopping will go up. And there's a very interesting finding, which existed actually before the crisis, long before the crisis, that online grocers basically found that if people did the thing three times, they were converts. That doesn't, now, that doesn't mean that you never shop physically. It simply means that someone who's shopped online for groceries three times in reasonably close succession now views that behavior as part of their repertoire. It's no longer an outlier. And that, that's very important because, you know, there, if you think about it, there are a lot of behaviors where there's a great deal of upfront investment required before the benefits become apparent. So the first time you shop for groceries online, it'll be easier to crawl to the store over broken glass on your knees. 
On the other hand, the third time you shop online, most of the things you buy are already in your favorites list. The software is intelligent enough to remind you about things you might have forgotten that you bought on previous occasions. And you could pretty much do a whole family's weekly shop in about 10 minutes. And suddenly the time, when you're there on your first ever visit typing pimentos, return, you know, when every single thing has to be searched for, it's an unbelievably tedious process. Over time, the, the, the time saving becomes quite spectacular. And, uh, by the way, one of the interesting things I would, I would actually make a claim for in government is that sometimes government should intervene to change a case where a large number of people always do one thing and never do another thing. Okay, at the very least, it would be valuable for government to intervene so that everybody does the other thing at least three times a year. Because having done that, let's take car travel versus train travel. Okay, I made the slightly egregious suggestion that in the UK, your tax disc for your car should cost a hundred pounds more than it does at the moment, but you should get a hundred and twenty pounds of rail vouchers, non transferable, given to you when you tax your car. And the point I'm making there is someone who uses the train three times a year and the car 150 times a year, when they have a major journey, they will at least think of using the train and they'll be, and they'll be experienced enough in using the train to consider it an option. If you haven't traveled by train at all for the last 10 years, it doesn't even enter your solution space. And I think, by the way, also there may be behaviors like installing solar panels where what you might almost say, if I were government, is I'd say the first three people in a postcode district, or in, in a, that's in the smaller postcode district, not the American zip code district, the first three people out of a group of 30 houses to install solar panels get a significant government subsidy. After that, it declines. And the reason for that is that um, since we're a very social species and we tend to copy other people, we're disproportionately reluctant either to do something new for the first time, that's breaking habit, or to be the first person in a group to do something different, and that's breaking a social norm. And you could design legislation which is just designed to get the sigmoid curve over the initial hump. And so let's say you said that in your, in your street, which let's say has 30 houses in it, the, you know, the first two people to install solar panels would get a 30% subsidy, after which the next three people would get 10 and the next people will get nothing okay it may seem strange a it would create a sense of scarcity and urgency so people who are thinking about it would think well i, be I better get onto this before it's down to 10 percent but also as funnily enough um nicholas christakis has shown once three of your neighbors have solar panels you will feel a much less a markedly less level of uh, social awkwardness or embarrassment in installing the things yourself and in the same way, someone who makes 150 car journeys a year and three train journeys, what I'd say of that person is when they make a decision between train and car, it's at least a partially informed decision. They know there are benefits to both modes of transport. And, you know, let's say they're with a friend and they really want to chat for the whole time, they might choose to go by train or they might want to read a book or have some work to be done. Then on those occasions, they might choose the train. Someone who hasn't used the train for 10 years doesn't really have a clue about train travel. And when they're, when they're getting in their car, that's not evidence of the superior utility of the car over the train. It's merely evidence of total ignorance of train travel. So with that said, what consumer behaviors do you think are inherently resilient? Oh, habit and social copying are, are and by the way, they make much more sense when you change the mathematics of economics and you understand a concept called ergodicity, the fact that humans are risk averse and like to minimize variance. In other words, they, they'd prefer something that's definitely quite good to something that's possibly brilliant and possibly terrible. Then when you think about it, social copying and habit make more and more sense because they're a reliable heuristic for avoiding disaster. So it's my opinion that social connection, for example, since uh, because of this pandemic, a social connection is, is akin to propagation in that I believe the drive is stronger than the fear to a degree. I'm hearing people saying, well, movie theaters aren't coming back. People aren't going to want to grow to crowds. And people are saying, well, cruise ships are done. I don't think so. That drive for people to get together is just hardwired. 
I mean, some of them financially, I I'm not talking economically or financially, how, how sound they, they've been running their businesses, but just from a standpoint of consumer behavior, I think that's going to come back. So, no, I think there are significant differences between behaviors which were always driven by choice, which is the decision to go on a cruise, okay? Not, I mean, I'm sure there have been people who've been socially pressured into going into a cruise, or onto a cruise with friends. But most of the time, you have a level of voluntariness around that. The only worry I'd have about the cruise ship industry would be, generally, once people have been on a cruise once, they're either converts or they're rejectors. But most people feel a disproportionate amount of anxiety about going on their first ever cruise. You know, it tends to be when they're slightly older in life. So the existing cruise aficionados are going to come back. Whether there's an acquisition problem is a different one. Because now, you know, it only takes one member of the family to go, you know, I don't want to end up in a coronavirus outbreak. So in, in, you know, in the medium term, you know, it's likely that existing crews, then there are behaviors, I think, like video calling, where actually there are a hell of a lot of people who would have liked to have worked much more remotely than they did, but were simply prevented from doing so by social pressure. If you think about it, it only takes one asshole boss to prevent 45 people from working from home flexibly at any time. That's a good point. So, so now there's this tipping point that if, if a boss, if an executive doesn't manage his people well, you're going to see that tip go to the remote versus, uh, uh, that's interesting. It, it, might, it might well be that WPP from the very top now spot the real estate savings and efficiency gains here and start to say, essentially, you know, although the decision as to working remotely and the extent has to be um, it has to involve discussion between the employee and his direct report or supervisor. We do not consider, you know, a complete blanket ban on this behavior to be acceptable. You know, that, that, that's certainly something I would argue, you know, if I were Mark Reed, I'd say, look, you know, it, to some extent, it's up to you to work out at, at a localized level what's the right ratio of one thing and another and whether it's Monday or whether it's Friday. But I would say that, that um, for a boss to completely veto um, any form of remote working uh, would be considered, unless you have extremely good reasons, would be considered egregious, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. What do you think about movie theaters? Is that, is that going to come back? That's a very interesting one, the movie theater. Again, a lot of people will go back to movie theaters. The only thing I would say is it's probably time, and this is also true of theater theaters, by the way, as well, so in other words, you know, Broadway and uh, the West End. One of the things I think that will happen is that at the moment you can go to the Metropolitan Opera at your local movie theatre. So you don't need to travel into New York. You pay probably about 50 to 60 percent more than you might for a movie ticket. But you get a live broadcast from the New York Met. And about four million Americans, I think, have viewed the New York Met at their cinema in the last year or so. Now, the interesting thing is those things tend to be quite limited. And the other thing they haven't done is nobody's made that available at home yet. And I would argue that one way in which you could make more money from staging a play while having audience seating less dense would be to simply allow me to pay £35 to watch a play from London's West End or indeed from Broadway filmed in pretty good quality, streamed live to my home rather than to a movie theater. And possibly people like Disney will have to realize, okay, you can watch this thing at home at the same time as it comes out in the movie theater, but you just have to pay quite a lot. Now, weirdly, I do a strange thing. If you're going to the theater and you're watching the theater on your TV, I wouldn't allow people to record it. You've got to watch it live or you don't watch it at all. Because I think if you watch things recorded, some of the magic goes. It's true of football, it's true of opera in a weird kind of way, that it's a different experience if you do it live to if you do it recorded and edited. I don't understand the, the standard rationale which is used to prevent live streaming of lots of events is the very same rationale that was used in the United States until I think as recently as the 90s, certainly the 80s. You couldn't broadcast the Super Bowl on television or major baseball matches. Was it within 500 miles of the stadium? There was a, There was a there was a geographical kind of exclusion zone within which a live match couldn't be broadcast because the idea was it would cannibalize audiences who otherwise would have traveled to the stadium. 
Now, the standard reason you don't broadcast plays live on television, even though people would pay the price of a ticket to watch it, uh, is because of cannibalization. I think this is an erroneous, or rather, it's an exaggerated belief. You know, that's rather like saying that the McDonald's drive through window cannibalizes the McDonald's restaurant experience. To an extent, it does. I'm sure there are people who turn up and use the drive through window who would have gone into the restaurant had the drive through window not existed. But the drive through window also brings in a whole heap of custom who wouldn't have bothered stopping if it had required them parking and getting out of their car. And I think, so just to give an example, if you go to the theatre in London, okay, the tickets might cost £50 each. That's actually a relatively small part of your expense for the evening because you've got to have two tickets, £100. You might need babysitting. Uh, that's another 50 okay? You might have a meal out. That's another £60. You might have to park your car or buy train tickets, which, depending on where you live in the UK, the train tickets could cost 100 At an extreme level, you may have to stay overnight in London because you can't get home in time. Now, for people who live in Aberdeen, it seems particularly ridiculous that London theatre isn't allowing Aberdeen theatre enthusiasts to pay, let's say, £40 to watch it live as a family on their TV. Because if you think about it, there's a weird missing gap. There's no really high-priced pay TV, with the single exception of heavyweight boxing. The world heavyweight boxing bouts. OK, you can charge 100 bucks for that. But one of the interesting questions I ask is if you look at the attendant travel costs, you could save money and save an awful lot of wasted time by paying £50 to go to the theatre on your television rather than paying what works out at £250, of which the theatre only gets 100 to go to the theatre in, in the physical space. And I think, I think that that idea of cannibalisation and revenue abstraction finance people because they're influenced by economics always over-exaggerated, the risk of it. Do you think there are any behaviors we are doubling down on right now? Do you think there's going to be backlash to, let's say, cooking in your home? Like, Are we going to get sick of behaviors that we're doing now? That question, by the way, is a brilliant question, because is baking a discovered new joy in response to enforced seclusion? Or if it was a joy, has it become work? Exactly. Is it actually the enforced necessity of finding a hobby which can be performed inside the home to, to as an inadequate substitute for going out and meeting your friends? Also, association. What will I associate this behavior I'm doing with the pandemic? That, that's a very interesting thing. So will you associate baking? And that can happen, by the way. You know, simply very negative associations can have extraordinary... And again, the evolutionary psychology of that is obvious in learning. You know, if every time you eat a particular flower, you vomit, you learn to view that plant or flower with some revulsion. And so that associative stuff, which is part of how advertising works, you associate the product with good stuff in the person's mind, okay? Um... Uh, then uh, that's a really interesting question. And the only thing I think you can say is both, which is there will be a group of people who revert, indeed probably bake a little less than they did beforehand because they're done with it. There'll be a group of people for whom the behavior is sticky. And, you know, I mean, if you think about it on breakfast, one of the things that's going up, egg sales are through the roof in the UK. Now, most people in Britain didn't have a cooked breakfast. And of course, one of the things they're discovering now is that um, uh, you know, more and more people are making something out of breakfast. It, it's making a virtue of necessity, which is a phrase which first appears in English in Chaucer, you know, in the 14th century. So it's, you know, it's clearly a fairly old behavioral bias where you, you kind of go, I have to do something, so therefore I'm going to make a pleasure out of it or a virtue out of it. And, and uh, patently, you know, poof, that's written in. The, the, the truth of the matter is the question is unanswerable because it will depend, you know, People who have two days a week working from home will probably continue with a more elaborate breakfast regimen because the lack of need to leave the house on time and the fact that you can get up a bit, you know, in other words, the time you have between waking up and starting work is significantly wider because you don't have the commute impinging into that time. You know, my guess would be that people who are working remotely will continue on a breakfast regime. This is, by the way, why prediction is so difficult. So an economist would say, uh, essentially, 
People will be searching for value more than ever before after the crisis. What you'll actually find is that a chunk of people a chunk of the time are searching for value. A chunk of people a chunk of the time are doing exactly the opposite. They want a binge. They want an indulgence. In China, the phrase has come up, revenge shopping, which is the idea that you're going to go on a massive orgy of retail therapy to make <laughs> up for lost time. I, be I believe that. Equally, okay, equally, this is, this is where the great thing is. The great problem in marketing and human behavior is that in physics, the opposite of a good idea is wrong. In marketing, the opposite of a good idea is, also, is often also another good idea. And so the opposite of a behavior, I always give the example of this, funnily enough, of the face mask, which is, I'd always interpreted the face mask as slightly rude because it suggested that you didn't trust the hygiene and health of the people around you. I then subsequently learned that in Asia, it's mostly done for pro-social reasons, which is you don't want to spread an infection to anyone around you. So it's not actually a selfish act. It's, it's a generous one. Let's talk marketing, advertising. What has been your advice to your, your brands and your advertisers in, in this time? Is it make sure you craft the message this way, or is it, hey, the media buys are very cheap, double down? Well, the first thing is the media buys are very cheap, double down. In other words, if you're in a category which is not adversely affected, and most importantly, where your employees are not adversely affected, doubling down would make a lot of sense because it's a fantastic time to gain an awful lot of what you might call excess share of voice, ESV, in your category at a very, very low cost because audiences are up, but media costs are down. Okay, audiences are up by necessity because what else are they going to be doing? And yet the cost of the media is down. And so the interesting thing is it would make absolutely logical business sense for every company to advertise quite heavily to the extent they were able. Because it's a way, you know, the extent to which your share of voice exceeds your market share is a fairly good predictive value on the extent you're going to grow. On the other hand, I entirely understand why someone who is having to furlough staff or indeed make staff redundant does not feel comfortable at that point visibly showing to their staff how much they're spending on advertising at that moment. Even if for the health of the business, it might make medium to long-term sense. I can understand in the short term why it would create spectacular resentment from staff who in many cases are having to bear the brunt of the problem. So it kind of depends which category you're in, the extent to which you can do it. There's some categories where, of course, the product is highly relevant to the crisis. And in those cases, they're probably doing quite well and as a result, advertising heavily makes particularly good sense. Equally, it's a very interesting question. What do you do? If you can divert your resources as a company towards helping people out, or you can do anything that is meaningfully useful towards helping people, as far as possible, do well in the current situation, do that thing and tell people about it. You know, actions speak louder than words in many cases. Obviously, if you're a simple product like Clorox or Dettol, okay, it's a fairly easy ask because the use of the product is, is directly applicable to fighting the um, pandemic. If you can do anything, you can rejig anything that makes it easier for your customers or be more reassuring for your customers to do things more easily under these special conditions. Do those things and tell people about them. Now, the advantage of that is the money spent telling people about them won't be viewed with the same hostility as conventional advertising spend because it's viewed as necessary information rather than discretionary advertising spend, okay? And, you know, that would have a difference in the way that staff would respond, I think. You know, no one would grudge their employer telling customers information of, you know, particularly pertinent relevance. And then the other question is, what, what do you do if there's nothing you can do? And that's a much more difficult question. I don't know. You know, one of the problems we face is hotel brands. What the hell, or airline brands, how the hell do you get people back? Now, interestingly, um, I think volume of air traffic in the US is starting to grow again. The level of occupancy on planes is pretty tiny. Put it this way, you won't have any trouble getting a middle seat free because the plane's way less than half full. But what you do both to identify and to promote to people in three or four weeks' time the fact that you should, you, know, you should return, do you talk about how much you're doing to prevent the problem, in which case you may actually make people more frightened? There are interesting things in reverse psychology where putting on a product contains no cyanide, which should be a reassuring message, is anything but. It, you know, you know, you'd never drink a soft drink where it said contains no cyanide on the outside because uh, suddenly a whole load of doubts have just been triggered that you didn't have before you opened the can. Well, right. So, because I'm, because I'm, 
I'm seeing that in commercials. I'm seeing that in appeals where people go, come on down. We, we're using alcohol. We have wiped down the, I wonder just from, I find it comforting. Hey, they're, they're cognizant and, and that makes me comfortable. But I, I didn't know if there was a backlash effect. Again, I think you'll have, this is one of those problems where you'll have both. Because one, you know, one of the great lessons, it's not like physics, okay, where all atoms react to the same stimulus in the same way. Uh, the great thing of psychology is that context has a huge effect and personality has a huge, huge effect on how, and of course your past memories have a huge effect on how you process and therefore respond to information. And so the same information, you know, you could argue that the phrase new to a technophile, the phrase new is like catnip, whereas to a 70 year old, you know, new type of computer would be about as off-putting a phrase as you could possibly use. Do you see a, a bounce back economically to some degree of normal within the year? I mean, fundamentally, and Mark Ritson makes this point very forcefully, and we mustn't forget this, that you know, human nature doesn't change very much. On the other hand, it does change its form of expression sometimes. So you know, if you looked at young people living in cities, where you travel to has a bigger bearing step on your status than what car you own. Now, in California in 1950, that wouldn't have been the same case, really. Okay, So the invention of things like the Instagram has made travel and holidays a very strong status signaling product, whereas cars have become arguably weaker if you live in a large metropolitan city. So the fundamental motivation doesn't change very much. The form of expression and the currency of expression can change. So, you know, I don't write off the risk of flug scam becoming more of an issue. That flight shaming, in other words, gratuitous travel, may actually occasion, you know, almost more shame than pleasure in 5, 10, 15 years' time. I mean, it may do, it may not. I, I, genu I mean, genuinely, I, but I, well, I, all I'm saying is I don't rule out the possibility. Equally, I think most motivations, you know, most fundamental human motivations, including being with friends and being with other people, will uh, gradually, not necessarily a V shape, but will, you know, will gradually return to some new baseline, okay? Not many things will disappear completely. But my one caveat is there may be a few behaviors where we have reached a kind of new equilibrium, where, for example, the, the negatives associated with meeting someone remotely, which were very, very... If you think about video conferencing, I said this on an Australian meeting this morning, that when it, video conferencing was novel, it was also pretty crap. And when it stopped being crap, it was no longer novel. And so... A lot of people have a perception of video calls, which is based on botched Skype attempts in the early, you know, in the late 1990s or something, or early 2000s, more accurately. Um, and they've written it off as a technology because their last memory of that technology was when it was rubbish. You know, coach travels the same with me. I last traveled on a coach in, uh, you know, much to my surprise, coaches now have toilets, quite comfortable seats, and are quiet and have a very good ride. But my last memory, my last experience was 20 years ago. So forced collective behavior is going to change some things uh, in a ratchet way. Some behaviors aren't going to revert to the original status quo. But in another way, it would be an extraordinary waste if they did, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, if we didn't use this as an opportunity to slightly recalibrate where we spend our time, our effort, and what we focus on in terms of what's important to us, it would be an extraordinary waste of, um, you know, kind of seven weeks of lost economic activity. There's an awful lot of I don't know. And the reason for that is that what's interesting about this crisis, it isn't only that we don't understand fully what's going on, and we still don't understand it. There are huge elements about transmissibility and susceptibility that we genuinely don't know. What makes it also different is we can't even pretend we understand it. So a lot of complex things we effectively put away in a cupboard. I would accuse you know, economics of doing this to a large extent, going, we don't actually understand human behavior at all, but this economic model seems to make sense, so we'll just pretend it's a description of human action. And we've satisfactorily boxed that away in the tick box job done drawer. 
Now, I think what's interesting is, you know, in many ways, there are many, many social sciences which really are the pretense of understanding. They're a model which is a pretty poor approximation of reality, but they're, it's kind of good enough or it seems plausible enough for us to accept it. What's really interesting about this crisis is, you know, there's a whole load of stuff which not only do we not understand it, we can't pretend that we do. And you know, in terms of which countries and which cities, why Germany is so ill-affected and so Austria is so little affected, it could be a healthcare action, it could be governmental action, it could be the date of lockdown, it could be something they do differently in hospitals, which we've never noticed before. It could be simply path dependent, which is the early people to be infected in Germany tended to be young. So whereas the median age of someone infected in Italy, I think, was 74 the median age in Germany was 46 in the early stages of the disease. And it may just be that who gets it bad first leads to a completely different outcome. And the truth of the matter is, which of those theories, if any, is true, don't know yet. We won't know for another year and a half. Rory, we are out of time here. Thank you so much for coming back on, and especially uh, during this time. And I I was so curious as to your opinions on things, and and I, I value the time I have with you. So, Thank you again for coming on. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay well. All the best. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed it, do share it with your friends and on your social platforms. Big thanks to Sam Williams, my audio guy. And the beautiful bumper music you're hearing is Michael Petrovich's Bella Luna. For all my show notes or resource links, visit LarryWeeks.com. And we will talk again soon. Mm -hmm.